Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel and to highlights of Liège, Baston Liège 2021, Full Sang, Roglic, Alaphilippe, Pagancha, all in attendance here. The clue is in the name. The race goes from Liège down south to Baston and then back up to Liège. Over 4,300 metres of climbing in this 260 kilometre long course. And the key climbs in this race are the Cote de la Redoute, which crests with 35 k's to go, 2 k's at about eight and a half nine percent and the Cote de la Roche or Faucon 13 k's from the finish 1.3 k's at ten and a half percent and I got to be honest with you for the first 224 k's of this race I was thinking to myself have I made the correct career decision watching this the breakaway they got their money's worth in this race with the camera time even I think Loic Vliegen getting more camera time than Ineos during important parts of the race, they had a six minute lead and the Peloton weren't too fast about chasing them. Movistar, Ineos and Quickstep were the main teams patrolling the front for Balverde, Kwiatkowski and Alaphilippe respectively. Luis Leon Sanchez, the Spanish national champ, broke up the tedium with about 84 k's to go, followed by Omar Freire. They did similar things this time in the Basque Country to great effect, but the teams are too strong behind here. Greg Van Avermaet, Golden Greg, hope the Olympics get cancelled this year so he can keep wearing gold for another 10 years, attacked as well. But he got brought back, and the most exciting part was Pagacha having a rear wheel puncture change. But this video's got to be under 20 minutes, so I can't show the full rear wheel change. He got back on with about 60 or oh, 63 k's to go without too many troubles. Mark Pudun, unlucky not to get a Giro stage win last year after a mechanical attack to join Mark Donovan and Harun van Hoeker, but the race really only started to heat up on the run into the Cote de la Redoute, quick step assembling formation, making sure Alaphilippe is in the front, five to six wheels going into that climb with 36 k's to go. You can see the gap now down to a minute 40 to the breakaway, and it was Ineos who spiced this up. Teo Gagenhart on the front, Kwiatkowski on his wheel, Carapaz third wheel, Pagacha right behind Adam Yates in front of Maximilian Schachmann in good position. I thought this was a fantastic photograph, had to include it. And Ineos actually created a split on the Redoute, but they weren't really able to keep it going too well, maybe because, yes, they've dropped Julian Alaphilippe from this front group, but they've got Roglic, Pagacha, Sharkman, and Balberde there. So that was probably a few too many of the main contenders to really sacrifice your team. It all came back together again before the Côte de Forge, where Ineos forged on again with Teo Gagenhart, Adam Yates in the wheel marked by Vingegaard, and you can see Yates attacking behind. Pagacha counted over the top of him with Jack Haig on his wheel. But again, the group seemed to be too large for Ineos liking, so they attacked with Richard Carapaz with 21 k's to go. Kind of like what they did with Amstel Gold Race after the Kalberg, rolling attacks with Kwiatkowski and Pidcock. And Carapaz got a pretty decent gap of over 20 seconds with no teams really willing to chase before he got into this quasi super tuck position for which he was later disqualified. I don't have time here, but we discussed this at great length on the LRCP Clips YouTube channel, link in the description. But he was brought back anyway, so it was of no moment. And it was Davide Formolo, second at this race as recently as 2019. Mike Woods and Godu on his wheel, catching Carapaz on the Cote de Roche au Faucon with about 14 k's to go. Pagacha had obviously given him the directive to absolutely light this climb up, and Mike Woods countered over the top of that Formolo move, creating the race defining split. Roglic caught behind Hirschi and Formolo, who aren't going to work to bring back a group with Pagacha, Alaphilippe, Mike Woods. Alejandro Valverde and David Godu. The group worked pretty well together, apart from Valverde refusing to pull for five minute periods here and there. It was Pagacha actually pulling a lot. I mean, he pulls like an absolute truck on the flat. Tade Pagacha, one of the most complete, maybe if not the most complete cyclist in the world. And with just a tired Roglic, Kwiatkowski, Schachman and Fulsang half chasing, half attacking each other behind, this group had a healthy gap going into the final kilometer where they forced Alejandro Balberde. Well, maybe, I mean, forced is a strong word. They're all track standing. There's no reason why Balberde couldn't have gone fourth or fifth wheel as well. He put himself on the front and that made it difficult for him to calculate how close the group was behind him. You can see that Alaphilippe has got more of a clear view to see, okay, we've got a decent 200 meter gap to the group chasing behind. You'll remember last year in Liège, Morich caught this group and then Alaphilippe had to close down his attack, which might have cost him in that sprint. You've got Wood's second wheel, Godu third wheel, Alaphilippe fourth wheel, perhaps the favorite for this sprint, and Mark Hirschi, the UAE team Emirates teammate of Tane Pagacha, is chasing 
behind, about 100 metres behind the Pagacha group, with Pagacha in great position. Bit strange from him. I know he's only bringing Teish Benoit and Molima, but I'm not sure that's exactly what Pagacha would have wanted at that moment. This is a strong headwind sprint. We knew that from the women's race. So being on the front, having to accelerate into the wind is not where you want to be for Alejandro Balverde. And somewhat surprisingly, Balverde, who's been left on the front, perhaps overly concerned with the group behind, kicks with 275 metres to go into this headwind. And I know he's got in his ear people screaming, vamos, show them your cojones and a tope. But this really cost him in this sprint. And that provided a perfect slipstream for Alaphilippe and Tari Pagacha to get back up to speed with Pagacha coming around Julian Alaphilippe in the last 25 metres to win by half a wheel length. And I want you to focus on this moment right here where I think last year's Liège and perhaps the headwind changed the outcome of this race. At this point, if Alaphilippe sprints to the right-hand barrier, he will not be disqualified for deviating. I'm telling you, he would not have been endangering Tata Pagacha. Pagacha would have had space on the left-hand side of Alaphilippe to continue his sprint. Demar did exactly the same thing to Peter Sagan in the Giro last year with no sanction. And if Alaphilippe goes to that right-hand side, I think this sprint would have been a lot closer. Instead, Alaphilippe is more concerned with shutting off the draft to his back wheel. So he goes to the left in front of Mike Woods, trying to get Pagacha out of his slipstream. But that, in fact, allows Pagacha to slingshot perfectly to the right-hand side. Might not have made a difference, but I think it would have been closer at the end. Regardless, Tane Pagacha, just 22 years old. He's already won like 26 pro races, 16 World Tour level races, the first reigning Tour de France champion to win a monument since Bernard Eno in the 70s. Thanks to Flamme Rouge for that one. We knew his sprint uphill was outstanding from Andalusia, and he's beaten Roglic in uphill sprints almost more times than Roglic has beaten him. But we saw in the Tour de France last year in a flat sprint on stage nine, he beat Hirschi and Roglic. And last year in Liège, Baston Liège, he was going to beat Alaphilippe and Roglic in the sprint and was denied a chance to win, except Alaphilippe went full potato. And Pagacha is such a complete rider. His time trialing is outstanding on the flat, on hilly terrain as well. His pure climbing saw on Prati de Tivo this year, Petersud last year, out of this world. In tough, rainy conditions on hard, up and down courses, he's also outstanding. Good at Strade, nearly chased down Mathieu van der Poel on that Terreno stage, and his parkour knowledge and choices in difficult finales is also outstanding, except for maybe that descent in the Basque Country, stage six. They made a mistake there, UAE. But generally, he makes few mistakes in reduced bunch sprints or tricky finales. Sorry, beat Roglic, actually, in stage three of the Basque Country, where he seemed to know the parkour just a bit better. But comment down below, are you Team Pagacha or Team Roglic? Who do you think is the better rider out of the two Slovenians as an all-rounder. But Pagacha took out Liège, Alaphilippe second, David Gurdu, a really nice third for him. But that's the end of the Arden Classics. I hope you enjoyed all the videos. Like this one down below if you liked it. That's all from me, and I'll see you later in the week. Ciao.